Let's open our Bibles uh, to 1 Timothy. And as we turn to 1 Timothy 4, we're going to begin studying what I call the Word-Filled Life. You're going to hear that a lot because we're going to actually, after this introduction, go back to the 119th Psalm and study the concept of meditation from the 119th Psalm. There are eight different passages, and I really think that in in all the Bible, in one place, the 119th Psalm distills down the essence of what meditation and the word-filled life is all about. But as you turn to 1 Timothy 4, let me introduce that idea by talking to you about the distracted generation. That's the generation that you and I live in this morning. Have you ever noticed how distracted people are? It seems like everyone is looking for something to do, and then when they do it, they don't enjoy it because they were thinking about doing something else. Now think about that. I was thinking about it Friday night, Friday afternoon, I don't remember when it was, but somehow I was conned into taking the kids to the noisiest place in Tulsa. It's called Chunky Cheeses or something like that. And I mean, it's certainly a place you would never find me. I actually wore my earplugs I use when I mow the lawn. So there I am with these big orange earplugs in, you know, it's just too noisy for me. And the kids were having a blast and they had raked our half acre of leaves. And for that, they each got a dollar to spend at Chuck E. Cheese's. But I'm not selling their services. You can't have them do your yard. But it was wonderful. And so they were, they went and they had their little cup of coins and uh, those little tokens. And so I was enjoying watching them. And while I was enjoying them and listening to them and watching their delight, I began going like this and looking at all the adults that were around me. And I noticed something interesting about them. I noticed how distracted they were. Here, my children were excited and having a blast. And for a few moments, as I looked at the parents around me, many of them appeared to still be at the office. Their children were excited, running from game to game, gleefully enjoying themselves. And there were those parents like me, holding their cup of tokens. But if you looked at their faces, they were looking... They were looking somewhere. They were not connected with where they were at that moment. And as they stood there, holding the cup of tokens, looking off in the distance at what I couldn't tell, one thing was sure they weren't at Chuck E. Cheese's. Those parents were riveted in my mind because they are a picture of our distracted culture. Holding tokens to life, those around us are spending... And we're not even paying attention. You see, they weren't where they were. They were somewhere else. Wishing they were somewhere else, but they had to be here. And so they were enjoying neither place. Neither were they enjoying where they wanted to be, nor were they enjoying where they were. They were distracted and torn between two worlds. And hand in hand with distraction is dissatisfaction. Part of the reason there are so many dissatisfied people in our world is that they're completely distracted from what they're doing by something else they think they want to do. And so this morning we live in a distracted world among distracted people with distracted minds, with distracted families, and with distracted lives. And distraction, when practiced by habit, leads to aimlessness. We don't really have a direction because we're always wanting to be somewhere than where we are. And then that leads to a feeling of uselessness. And uselessness often leads to hopelessness. And then we're powerless to do anything about it. And it just becomes a vicious cycle. And for a believer, God has said, and we're going to see specifically starting in verse 11, God has said that the guard against a distracted life is what the Lord offers to us. He calls a word-filled life. A word that is filled with God's word. So that he can focus us, so that God himself can nurture us to go in a direction that he has chosen. The only protection we have to prevent our lives from being distracted is a word-filled life, from being dissatisfied is a word-filled life, from being useless is a word-filled life. God wants me to have his focus in my life. God wants my life to be aimed at his glory. He wants my life and your life to be fulfilling his calling, filled and overflowing with his hope and living after the power 
of an endless life. That's what a believer has. And that's what you and I are to be doing. And God has one solution for an aimless and hopeless and useless and powerless life in his people. He describes it eight times in the 119th Psalm. Meditation. We need to look at a discipleship manual. Now, I love 1 Timothy. I want you to think about what this is. The Apostle Paul led a young man to faith. His name was Timothy. He nurtured that young man until he grew up and went off into living out what Paul taught him. And then Paul wrote him discipleship lessons. Now, I don't, I don't know whether you collect these, but I checked on my shelf and I have about 120 different books on discipleship in my office. I was thumbing through different ones of them this week, and I kept looking on the spines at the numbers going up. And I thought, of all of those books that are trying to take what this one book says and kind of put it into our language, let's see what this one book says. Because the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, whom he had led to Christ, was a letter of nurture. 1 Timothy is a discipleship manual, a guide for directing a life Godward. In chapter 4, we find a series of steps. And what I love is, it's not suggestions and it's not principles. Each one of these steps I'm going to show you, God commands. Very interesting. He commands through the Spirit of God breathing out through the Apostle Paul. Paul says to Timothy, You must do this. Now, the thing about my 120 discipleship books I have on my shelf, you don't know which one to do. They all have a different pattern and plan and idea and steps and, you know, and all that. But what's neat about this is it just cuts right through it. And it says, this is what you have to do. If you want to be nurtured, if you want to be a disciple, if you want to grow in Christ's likeness. So let's look closely at the words of Paul's discipleship manual for a godly young believer in 1 Timothy 4, starting in verse 11. And I want you to follow along with me as we listen to these commands. Verse 11 of 1 Timothy 4. These things command. Now that's an imperative. I got my green marker out again. See, all of you in the front row, all the green. I love to mark these commands because remember Jesus said in the Great Commission, go into all the world and And teach all those who come to faith to obey those things which I've commanded you. And if you ever wonder what he commanded, he puts them in the imperative mode. So here's one. These things command and teach. That's another imperative. So he says, I want you to to get these things down so that you can tell others. You You can command and teach them. Verse 12. Let no one despise your youth. Timothy was a young fellow, weak, from a broken kind of, well, a, a unsafe father home with a godly mother. He cried, if you read this letter. Uh, he was weak. Uh, people didn't think well of him. And he just had a lot of problems. And so he says, and one of the things they looked down at him because they said he was young. He says, don't let anyone despise your youth. But here's another imperative. But, and here's an imperative, be an example to the believers in word. And the idea and the force of this is, you repeat that idea, be an example in conduct. That's an imperative. Be an example in love. Be an example in spirit. Be an example in faith. Be an example in purity. The word example is tupas. If you have a coin in your pocket, you look at that thing, that was die cut. There was a blank and a die came and stamped against it. And the exact image on the die was cut into that blank, that coin. He says, I want you to be an exact representation that can be stamped onto someone else's life of what they should be in their conduct, in how they talk, in how they, their love is expressed, how their spiritual life is, their faith, their purity. And then, verse 13, here's another imperative. Give, till I come, give attention to reading. And it's the same idea. Give attention to exhortation. Give attention to doctrine. Here's another imperative, verse 14. Do not neglect the gift that's in you. Boy, this is what discipleship's all about. If you're here this morning and you're born again, you have a gift that God put inside of you. Don't neglect it. You are going to answer to him one day all alone what you did with the gift he put within you. You know, in our churches, we... We often are so concerned about the abuse of gifts in other places that we neglect the gifts that we have. 
And we should, verse 14 is a sobering, don't neglect the gift, the charismata that is in you, which was given you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Verse 15, this is our theme. Meditate on these things. It's commanded. Meditate. Have a word-filled life. Give yourself entirely to what you're finding in the word, that your progress, others can see it will be evident to them. And then a couple more imperatives. Verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Let's bow for a word of prayer. We bow our hearts before you, our Redeemer and King. We have already been so blessed, so ministered to, so led into worship through your dear servants who have ministered to us. We joined with them in our hearts, with our voices. And now we ask you with our prepared hearts, As you have said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Worship precedes service, but service is based upon the word that you give us, how we are to act out and apply that in our life and serve you. Show us how this morning. Open our eyes. Open our wills. Open our hearts to say yes to you in some specific ways. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We need to think deeply about God in our shallow world. We live in a shallow world, a distracted world as I call it. And meditation, or some of your Bibles, uh, if you look at verse 15 of 1 Timothy 4, it might say take pains with, or or, they're all different ways. But the the base word underneath that is described as the, the mind digesting what it takes in. So meditation is taking pains or, or being absorbed by or, or getting into what we've taken into our mind. What we take into our minds, we process by meditation. And so meditation is learning to think deeply about something. Meditation is, is, is chewing through, digesting what it is that we've, we've taken in. There's a terrible spiritual condition that that just is rampant in the church. One is biblical anorexia. That means that that people have no hunger for the Bible. The other is biblical bulimia. That means that they lose all of it before they even leave the building. In other words, it's just it's gone. They they just they're gone. They don't they don't even remember what the sermon is about. Now it's okay when you're four. Because every week I, I do this. This is my habit with my kids. I say, What'd you learn in Sunday school? And so sweet to hear a four year old say, I don't remember. But it was good. You know, and that's okay when you're four. It's horrible when you're 40 or 24 or 34 or 14. And that's bulimia, where you just eject it from your mind and you don't even let it take root and meditate on it. Well, when meditation is going on, we take God's word, we examine it, we turn it over and over in our minds, and that's the way we properly nourish ourselves. And the scriptures tell us, because we're surrounded by confusing voices and twisted pathways that that kind of lay out before us, and we're not sure which one to take, and because there are so many voices coming and so many paths before us and so many lives that are in confusion and traveling fast, God says, I have a cure for you. And it's right here. It's just in this this sequence. Uh, he starts earlier in verse 7 of 1 Timothy 4. Reject profane and old wise fables. Exercise yourselves toward godliness. Discipline yourself. And that's how we got to Psalm 119. And then he goes down. He says in verse 12. He says, be an example. Verse 13, give attention. You see, he says, I want you. All of those are, are the concept of, of getting your mind focused on one thing. And doing something about it. So Paul instructs Timothy to devote himself completely to Christ. He gives him a simple list of items to follow. They start back in verse 7. He says, exercise yourself toward godliness. Then he's to command and teach the truth. In verse 12, he's to be an example. In verse 15, he's to meditate. Paul says, think deeply on what I've told you. Digest it. Apply it to your life. In fact, in the New Testament world, the word that Paul chose for What's in uh, the Bible, meditate or take pains with, carries the idea of, listen, being in something. In fact, what's interesting 
it, this word it, it uses the idea of being absorbed by something or being submerged in something. I, I was thinking about that. When I was sitting, we had a little spill that, that children are so full of illustrations, you know. They spilled something, and so what do you do? You put your napkin over by where the little spill is. And if you put a napkin near liquid, the liquid is drawn to the napkin. It just goes like that, you know, just, you can just, I love watching it, just goes right up the napkin. And you know what? That's the idea of the word filled life. You and I should allow our lives to get in contact with the word and to be capillated and drawn up into our lives like the, the spill goes up into the napkin. That's what he's saying. He's saying, Timothy, let it in. He says, give yourself totally to absorbing. Like a napkin absorbing water, it's hard to keep them apart. The napkin draws the water to itself, and the believer is to draw the word into his life. And what we meditate on controls us. What we meditate on dominates us. One way to look on meditation is to think of all the applications to life that a certain verse could have for us. And I challenge you this morning to start doing that for yourself. You look at this verse and you say, I mean, for example, um, verse 12, let no man despise youth, but be an example to the believers in word. And you start saying, how could that apply to me? Do I ever say things I wish I hadn't said? Do I ever look back and say, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't spoken so quickly. I wish I hadn't, you know, and you start applying that. Say, okay. I want to, as the scriptures say, set a watch at the door of my mouth. See, that's right there. What I'm doing right now, out loud, is meditation. I'm taking a word from the scriptures, allowing that word into my mind, and applying it to my life. And I'm thinking of all the ways that that scripture could apply to me. That is meditation. That is thinking deeply. You think deeply about what a verse implies and what our response should be to God. And then we think of every possible application that scripture could have in my life. And when we do that, we're meditating. Now, all of you that are students, I've had students in my home for a long time. And, and I was just looking at Elizabeth, and I have you know 14 more years of her. So, I mean, we're going to have uh, about... I don't know how many years I haven't, I don't want to think about that. It'll wear me out thinking about how many years we've been having students that are learning. But think about, what would you think, say, of a computer class that you went to that had no computers for you to work on? Would you feel cheated if you went to a computer class and never touched a mouse, never felt a keyboard, never saw a monitor, never actually interacted with a computer? Wouldn't you feel cheated? How about an aviation class that you went to and you never saw an airplane, you never went to an airport, you never took a flight, you never did anything to do with airplanes. Would you feel cheated about an aviation class? Well, don't you feel cheated if you go into this book and you never experience what it's talking about? Now, the experiencing is up to you. That's what the word-filled life is all about. You've got to get your napkin near the water and you've got to let it come up into your life and start affecting you. And that choice is studying the Bible, reading it, and, and applying it. Meditation applies it to my life. The word applied to my life, lived out. Now, if you've ever succeeded at anything, you understand what meditation takes. Anyone who succeeds at anything, learn to completely focus on that one thing. How about riding a bicycle? I mean, uh, this. how many children in a row have I... The day they take their training wheels off, you know, and dad holds on to the back of the seat and they're like this, you know, and they've got their, and they can't keep their feet on the pedals. And I'm saying, just keep your feet on the pedals. You won't fall over. I'm going to hold the back of your seat. And so pretty soon they keep both hands on the handlebars and they keep both feet on the pedals and they start feeling the pedals. And all of a sudden they don't feel like they're going to tip over. And you just keep holding the back of that seat. And usually I just go in a circle with them. And find, I keep my hand there, but I'm really not holding on. And finally I just pull my hand back. And you should see they go, and then they crash, you know, because they, <laughs> and they weren't watching where they were driving. That's the second lesson, watch where you're driving, you know. But, but it's the idea that, that finally they totally focused on holding on and pedaling. And they did it. Before, they were worried about falling, and they were looking at the cement, and they were looking at whatever. And, and if you've ever succeeded in anything in life, you've learned to completely focus in, in anything, in sports, in business. You, you learn to fully concentrate. Well, this morning, God wants us to succeed. God wants us to achieve the maximum life possible on earth. 
And to do that, we have to stay focused in spite of the distractions. And what I want you to do is to, to introduce this idea of meditation. I want to show you how a group of people, I call them God's team, how they made it through life in a very distracting world. Men and women who who went through every single distraction you and I face. They went through upheaval, job loss, spouse loss, family loss, health loss. They went through everything. Success and affliction. They went through it all. And yet they all had what I like to call a word-filled life in spite of what was going on around them. And so I I look at these people and I say, if they can do it, I can do it. And God's team of word-filled lives is a collection of individuals. They're God's team. They're men and women who lived extraordinary lives, yet they were ordinary people. By the way, all of them were not sinless. They all had problems. They all made mistakes. They all sinned. They all disobeyed. They all crashed. You know, they took their eyes off where they were going, like the bicycle learner, and they were like that, you know, and tumbled. I just... Even saying that, I can still see them flying off the bicycle. You know, it's a good thing they're young and nothing breaks usually. You know, but but this collection of people we're going to look at as we go on a journey through some chapters of the Bible. Let's go back to Genesis five, and I want you to do this. If you got a pen, pull it out because I'd like you to write just one. Um, little phrase about each of these people because I want to show you, uh, starting in Genesis 5, a group of word-filled lives in a distracting world with, with ancient people having contemporary problems. Nearly every one of us can relate to completely their problems that, that are in the ancient times, but they so, so contemporaneously attach to us. In chapter 5, let's see the first one who has a simple habit. In fact, each of these I'm going to show you has a simple habit that sets them apart from the rest of the world. They each practiced the simple discipline of meditation. Each one practiced what I like to call a word-filled life. And how did they do it? Were there key books or seminars or tapes or study guides that they all bought? No. They all heard from the Lord. He gave his word to them. So, we're on common ground. You and I have God's word. But the difference is, all of these people got that word, and they completely focused on what God told them, and did something about it. Chapter 5, starting in verse 22. God's team of ordinary men and women who had word-filled life. First one, Enoch had a word-filled life. Verse 22. Even as a dad, he had a word-filled life. It says in, in verse 22, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. And Enoch, verse 24, walked with God and he was not, for God took him. That's all we have about him. A little short like that. But look at this. Enoch walked with God. And this walk, verse 22 says, started after the birth of his son. Now listen to this. His family wasn't an excuse for him to neglect the Lord. Did you catch that? I hear a lot of times, oh, I don't have time for that. i got so much going on. I just, you know, I've just fallen on. My family's just taking all my time. Did you know that, that a family cannot be an excuse to neglect time with God? It, it doesn't stop there. That family, it says, after he had this child, it prompted him to seek the Lord daily. Your family, if you have a family, you know, what is a family? It's when you get married. There's a family of two, you and your husband or wife. So if you are married, you ought to be even more than ever prompted to have a word-filled life because that's the only way you're going to make it and not be distracted and empty and aimless and useless. But Enoch learned how to seek the Lord while living in a world so wicked That God had to drown every person alive on the earth except for the eight in the ark. How did Enoch stay word-filled? He meditated on the Lord while he walked. Now there's one. All of us walk, or most of us do. I mean, I only saw one wheelchair in here this morning. Okay, so all the rest of you are walking. And one is being wheeled. But it works when you're wheeled too. But the majority of us walk. And what he did is he thought deeply about God while he walked through life. Now, you and I are walking and we can choose what we think about while we walk. And if you take one verse, if you, in fact, on the way over in the car this morning, I said, okay, everybody in the car, we're all going to share one verse that we have on our mind that we have memorized and we're thinking about. Now, it was easy because I've been doing that quite a bit. But the first time I said that, 
people dove for their Bible to find one. You know what I mean? Because they knew Dad was going to look at him and say, what verse are you thinking about? I mean, I was just at a lunch, and I did this with a group of adults. I said, okay, I want all of you to quote at this lunch the verse that you have memorized that you're thinking through in your mind. I mean, forks dropped. You know, they were going, oh, no, it's coming to me. What am I going to say? I haven't been thinking about a verse, you know. But we should have a verse in our mind. I mean, what I'm thinking about is Romans 14, 11, I think, and 12. It's, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us will give an account of himself to God. I've been thinking about that for two weeks now. I have to give an account before God for my life. And I can't hide behind the elders, and I can't hide behind all the great Sunday school teachers. I can't hide behind a whole army of deacons. I can't hide behind uh, an incredible godly wife or wonderful children. I have to give an account for my life to God. And so this idea is that he thought deeply, and you and I should think deeply about a scripture. And so he did. Enoch walked with God. He followed the Lord. Look at chapter 6, because you know Enoch so well. And I want to show you in verse 22 a second Member Enoch walked with God, so he meditated while he walked with God. Meditation means that Enoch walked his talk with God. But chapter 6, Noah, Noah had a word-filled life, and he was consumed by his job. Did you catch that? He had a word-filled life while he was consumed by his job. Do any of you have a job that really consumes you, that you really have to do? I mean, if anybody had to do a job, Noah did. He had to get that ark done, or everybody was going to drown. I mean, you talk about a job with pressure. I mean, if he didn't get that boat built, you know, can you understand? I mean, this was a make it or break it, life or death thing. So he had a consuming job, yet that consuming job never kept him from having a word-filled life. I know a lot of people whose consuming job consume their spiritual life. He lived in the wickedest work spot in all of history. Did you catch that? That didn't detract his walk with the Lord. Noah lived in a time, if you look back at verse 5, we're going to look at 22, but look at verse 5. It says, at every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. Did you know that where Noah lived and worked, every single person's, every thought was only evil continually? Now, you can't say that about here. I mean, you might think your co-workers are bad, but you do not live with a world that is completely demonized and completely given over to sin. This world was so bad that God said, I must exterminate everyone. That's how bad. I mean, it, it's, we, don't, we don't really sometimes think about how bad the world was. So he lived in the wickedest work spot in history. And Noah had to work among people who had every imagination filled with evil. They were demonic, they were murderous, and they were immoral. Now, how on earth did he do it? Do you think your co-workers are bad? How did he do it? Well, it says in verse 22, Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Did you know, if you read closely in the text, we're not going to, we did this a few years ago and really waded through this. Did you know sometimes that God didn't speak to him for as long as a whole year between speakings. A year. In fact, we don't even know how much God talked to him during the the long period that he built the ark, which is anywhere between 60 and 120 years. But you know what? Verse 22 summarizes it. What God said, Noah remembered. Noah did according to all that God commanded. What God said, Noah kept thinking about. What God said, Noah obediently did it. Let me ask you this. Have you obeyed the last thing that God told you to do? Think about it. What is the last thing that your heart was spoken to, influenced by, impacted by, pierced, whatever you want to call it, warmed, touched by the Spirit of God, speaking through the Word of God? What's the last thing that God told you from His Word to do? Did you do it? See, that's the simple thing. Noah did what God said. What God said he kept thinking about. What God said he obediently did. Have you remembered, thought about, and acted upon the last truth you learned when God spoke to you through the voice of his apostles and prophets and servants in his word? The last time you opened God's word, were you listening to God or were you just reading? 
Think about that. When, when you open this book, it's not like reading the sports page. It's not like the financials. It's not like your emails. It's not just reading and seeing if it's worth even looking at. When you and I open this book, God is speaking. And he's saying, are you listening? Now, husbands, how many times has your wife talked and talked and talked? And then she said, are you listening to me? Oh, yeah. What did I say? And we get so embarrassed. We don't remember. Because we really weren't listening from our heart. We heard, and yeah, we know we're supposed to do that. You know, we, we have so many voices around us. There's so much coming toward us. In fact, for me, I get so much communication that sometimes I don't read it all. And what will happen is Bonnie, I print out a lot of things, and she'll say, did you read this? I said, uh-huh. She said, did you really? Do you know what it says? I said, what did it say? I said, I didn't see that in there. She said, I know you didn't. That's why, you know, we, we need help in really listening. And if we don't get the voice of God, then we don't think deeply about what he wants. And so I have a practice that the only thing that I read every word of is the Bible. Life is so full. And, and so when I read this, I click in. I mean, I focus on. That's why I had the earplugs at Chuck E. Cheese's. I mean, after I got everybody off, you know, spending their tokens, I plugged those things in and I started reading. And right there with all the carrying on, I was just enjoying so much because I could look at every word and listen to God. That's what the Lord wants. That's what Noah did. And the next time you open God's word, listen to God. Don't just read. Uh, Genesis 12, real quickly, let me show you. Now, there are, there are 11 of these. Let's look at Abraham for a moment. Chapter 12. Abraham had a word-filled life. And in verse 7 of chapter 12, we're going to see he had a word-filled life while experiencing a complete turmoil in his personal life. Boy, can you relate to him this morning? Abraham had a word-filled life while packing to move across the continent from one coast to the other. He went from the coast of the Persian Gulf all the way over to the coast of the Mediterranean. And he had to do a, a cross-continental move, and he packed up and had to go there. And he didn't have, you know, Atlas United van lines, you know, to, to help him. He had to do it himself. So he had that word-filled life while moving across the continent from coast to coast. He had a word-filled life even though he lost his job in the city and had to take up outdoor work. He had to go from a city slicker to being a cattleman out in the ranch, uh, being a herdsman. Abraham had a word-filled life while he had to move away from his family, while he had to raise his brother's son. Remember, his brother died and he inherited Lot, you know, and had to raise his brother's son. And even while moving from life in a two-story home in the city to a goat hair tent in the hills of Canaan, which I told you he ended up living in for a hundred years, camping. He had a word-filled life, even with all those distractions. How did he do it? Well, meditation meant Abraham built an altar or a meeting place with God everywhere he was. Look at verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So here's, he got, he got something from the Lord. And look what he does with what he got from the Lord. And there he built. The word means he established or he constructed an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, how did how how Enoch did it was he walked with God. How how Noah did it was he obeyed what God told him to do. How Abraham did it is look at this. He built these altars. Abraham marked out reminders of what God had revealed to him. Now, in a real sense, that's how I look on the Bible. That's why I, I mark in my Bible. When I learn something from the scriptures, I kind of make a little little altar out of that. And I mark it so that every time I come back through the scriptures, I see what I learned about God. I remember that process of him revealing something of himself, some truth, and some response he desired from me. And I mark that in my Bible. Abraham marked out reminders of what God had revealed to him. Abraham wanted to remember what God said, so he invested in special time-consuming efforts. 
To never forget what God had done, what God had promised, what God expected. And so on that spot, he rolled these big stones up and he made this altar and he he made it special. He cleared around it so he could find it again. And he piled up these stones and actually the word for built an altar isn't just piling stones. It actually is the word for a sacrificial. He didn't just pile stones. He gathered sticks. He brought a prized lamb or calf or whatever from his flock, and he killed them and shed their blood and burned them on top of that altar. We're not talking about a momentary thing, get a couple of rocks and throw them over there. He invested time. This man was old when he started this walk with God. He didn't have endless energy, and yet he wanted to remember anything God did so much that he invested whatever it took to build this altar, to make a sacrifice, to blacken and bloody and mark those rocks so he would never forget what God said. Can you remember what you read in the Bible yesterday? Do you remember what you read last week? Do we even take the time to make a mark in our lives for when the God of the universe intersects with us and reveals himself to us in his word and we just flip channels and go to something else just like that in life? Abraham couldn't do that. Altars marked the big events of his walk with the Lord. The question to us, do you listen? Do you mark clearly God's plans for you? Are you remembering or are we forgetting? Abraham built altars. Noah obeyed. Enoch walked. And each of them were going through personal stress, struggles, and distractions that are unparalleled in our lives, I have to say. None of us have walked 900 miles with our family walked and moved across the country walking. And none of us have lived in a tent 100 years. All of us can make an altar when God meets with us and say, God, I'm going to hold on to that. Even if I don't remember anything else in life, I'm going to remember what you taught me today and I'm going to think deeply about that. I'm going to apply it to my life because if I do that, then you will continue to reveal yourself to me. That's what a word-filled life's all about. Let's bow before the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for commanding in that discipleship manual Paul wrote to Timothy that we learn to practice the discipline of meditation in our lives, thinking deeply, applying to our life, not to other people's lives, not for biblical fact and trivia questions, but applying your word to our lives by obedience. I pray that you would help us to get absorbed in your word this week so that if you tarry and if you let us gather again next week, that when we gather and when I talk about remembering what you have taught us, that your saints in this place will actually remember meeting with you day after day after day this past week. Oh, Lord, help us to think deeply about you and apply your word to our life so that we can live a word-filled life. In the name of Jesus, we ask that. Amen.